shop. Uh, I'm making a drone flute uh, today. Uh, over the, well, over the course of the next couple of days, it does take a while. Uh, so I just thought I'd both put the camera on, give it a little film, and maybe put a little video up onto YouTube or something like that about it. Uh, so the flute that I'm going to make is made out of oak. So I've got these two pieces of oak, which I've just cut from a long length, a long piece. And that's more or less how I buy the wood, actually. I buy it uh, from, from the, the sawmill around the corner. Uh, it's all pretty well seasoned when I buy it. And I just get him to cut it into certain dimensions for me. So it's, this is roughly a, a, what started off as a three by one. So I can just then cut the length two lengths nice ready to go. Uh, these are going to be obviously glued together to make two halves of the flute. So the, the first thing that we need to think about is the key that the flute's going to be in as uh, to how long we're going to make it. Uh, so I know roughly that basically we want about a, a 400 mil uh, length of sound chamber and that's the, the long chamber at the bottom where the holes for the fingerings go uh, and then I need to obviously allow a little bit of an area for a block to separate the two chambers and then the slow air chamber about four inches and then about an inch and a half two inches for a mouthpiece that allows me then to work out the length uh, of the overall piece of wood uh, and you can work this out if you decide to make one yourself uh, there are plenty of references online to, to bore diameters and sound chamber lengths and the relationship between the two. So I'm going to flip over now and I'm going to put a different camera on so you can look down on the workpiece and see exactly what I'm doing. So here we have the two pieces of wood and as I described earlier I'm going to say this is the mouthpiece and that's the, the north end of the flute. That's where the sound comes out at the bottom, that's the south end of the flute. So the mouthpiece is going to be here. So we need to allow, as I said, between one and two inches. So let's just call it about there. And that gives us enough room. Uh, you, can, I mean, you probably should use a square for this and I just often just do it by hand, I'm afraid. So the sort of shape of the mouthpiece is going to be We'll take this, once it's been glued together and it's dried and we're going to form the mouthpiece, I tend to make the mouthpiece so it comes out like that and then just round that off with a sander afterwards and chamfer it downwards and we'll play with that once. They'll, they all come out a little bit different. So then, as the air, then there's going to be a channel there and a channel there for the air to come through into these two chambers here which is called the slow air chamber. So as I said, about a roughly four, four inches or so, so about there. So what we need to do is we need to separate these two areas. And this is probably, what's, what's the dimensions of that? I always do it by eye. Nothing's ever the same twice. So 15 millimetres that is, uh, between there, there and there. So what we'll do is we'll have, we'll have a hole there, we'll have a hole there. The air will come in here, up through that hole, across what we call the flue there. And then there'll be another hole here and a hole there. So when the block's on here, so the air will come up, travel, and then it'll split on the splitting edge here, and some of it will go down inside, and some of it will come out. And that's the principle of how a flute works. So then this is the sound chamber, and obviously this is in two halves, because it's a drone flute. So this side will have the holes on it, and this side will just be plain, uh, and that'll be the fundamental bass note, just droning away all the time. And then on this side we'll play the melody. So these are the lines that we need, these three lines, because when we get onto the router table, we need to know where to stop and start. Okay, so, and then what we'll do is just transfer those marks onto the sides, so that when we're, when we're running at it and we're looking at it like that, we've got the marks that we need. And we're ready to go off and route to the, the, uh, the chambers.
Right, so we've just been out and we've done the router in and we've come back in. And as you can see, we have slow air chamber and the sound chamber. That's the block and that's the mouse piece. So the next job really is to clean all of that up uh, and drill a couple of holes in there. And the, the holes are as a reference point for where the uh, the air, the, these two holes either side from a slow air chamber through to the same chamber uh, and it's so that when we've glued it together we know exactly where that area is that we need to work on the uh, first thing we do is here's a lighter. we're going to burn the inside of here we're going to sort of just not burn it to any great degree but we're just going to sort of make it so that when it burns and starts to uh, turn into charcoal -y type burnt wood it's a good water repellent uh, and it stops the moisture from your breath absorbing it into the flute quite so much uh, and it also burns away some of this, this stuff here. here we go So that's enough of that. Next job is just to clean it with a bit of sandpaper. We don't want to be taking too much of that charcoal -y away. We want to get rid of that when we glue these two together, these two halves. We want to, don't want any little splinters or burrs of wood which are going to get into the joint. We also don't want any of those burrs inside either of the chambers that will affect the flow of air which could make the flute useless could make it extremely unpleasant to listen to and a waste of time okay so there we go word of warning you'll lose your piece of sandpaper when doing this it just gets totally black and covered in charcoal uh get a fresh piece So we want a really good, we're going to glue these two halves together, so we want a nice, smooth, slightly keyed surface. So we need to determine which of these pieces is going to be the top of the flute and which is going to be underneath. And the way we do that is we look at the grain and we choose which one we think is most suitable, uh, i.e. without any knots or imperfections in the important area, which is this area. And this one has got a very small knot just there. So I think this one needs to be the top of the flute. Uh, I'm not too worried about imperfections because this is too thick anyway. Once this is glued together, I'm going to be cutting, putting this, running, running this down the saw and taking a, a little bit off there. But the knot obviously won't disappear with the saw. So this is going to be the top. So we're going to go as tight as we can in. There will be that little gap there, uh, but that's okay. It'll just alter the tuning slightly, and, but we'll adapt the tuning to match. And then we do bang center of the chamber, both sides of the block. And then we get the drill. And just drill perfectly straight and bang. I 
turn that over you can see we've got those holes there now which is rather lovely uh, there is another thing we can do at this stage and that is we can drill a hole or two holes to accommodate the lacing to hold the block on if we choose to have a hole there and a hole there this is a good time to drill those holes uh, before we glue it together and then we know 100% that we're hitting solid wood and we're not going to go into either of the chambers. Uh, sometimes if you don't need necessarily to put those holes in. So say this is the top of the flute and we want to put the block there and a block there. So we could just tie around the whole uh, flute to keep them blocked or we could have if we had the hole in the middle two holes in the middle there we could have two coming around tie in there two coming around tie in there it depends on what style that you want to do i'm going to put two holes in here so you can see what i mean so if you think about that is going to be the back edge of the sound hole so this is going to be really at the front where the air is, you want one as far to the back as you can to make that even. And my drill bit for that, that I normally use is this eight millimeter drill bit here. So I just need to make sure that's about right there. Put a little guide in. We want to make sure okay this is where it can go horribly wrong if you had a drill press it would be a lot better but unfortunately I do not own one as you can see I'm just being a little bit a little bit careful on that stuff because if we split that wood that would be quite disastrous Those, that isn't the best job in the world to be honest with you that uh, they aren't 100% lined up I mean the only consolation is that when the lacing's in there and it's all finished you're not really going to notice that but I sh what I should have done is drawn a line down there and done it properly but as usual I do it all by eye <laughs> sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't <laughs> so let's get rid of all this dust Maybe get that sandpaper on there and just make sure, in fact, there is some obstructions there. Let's just get rid of those burrs. Well, we're ready for the glue, folks. That's good news. This is really good, strong, solid glue. It's waterproof. Or weatherproof. I don't know quite how they describe it. It's fast cure. It's the best one you can get. I mean, there's lots of different brands. And We want a good amount of glue on there, we want it to do its job, but we don't want too much. Let's 
so here we go let's pop those two halves together now this stage we don't it's very easy it slips around when the two pieces come together like that I tend it the best to leave it put it upright onto the bench like that make sure those are just right and then we're gonna glue uh, clamp this now and where's my clamps smooth my cup of tea and all this lot from here just been shopping it's a quick save So, I'm not worried about putting blocks underneath the clamp and this will leave circular dents in the wood and that's because I'm going to be cutting some of this wood off, okay? If you weren't and you were using just the right thickness of wood, uh, then you would want to protect the wood from the effects of the clamps. And when you're putting these clamps on, you want to try and get on those areas not in the middle I mean it's not so bad with this because it's such a thick piece of wood there that even if I clamped there it probably wouldn't try and crush the chamber but if it was a thinner a thinner piece of wood and there was a small wall there then that would be a vulnerable a vulnerable spot Okay, <laughs> we're going to leave this to dry for 24 hours, uh, so about this sort of time tomorrow we'll be able to start work on it again. Uh, Welcome I'll... back, day two of the drone flute making exercise video. <laughs> so she's been, uh, she's been drying 24 hours, of rock hard now the glue, so she'll be completely set. So I'm just going to go about unclamping. And then as I said in the video yesterday, we're going to put this on the saw now and just trim down to get to the right level. mechanism and this is the back of the flute so uh, I don't know if you can see probably best coming to this camera uh, there's a pencil we're gonna go over to the saw now and we're gonna see that sort of thickness there which is about I don't know four or five mils maybe so take that much off there about that much off there as you can see, it's just approximate. It's roughly by by eye. So I probably leave. I'll cut to this side of the line to leave a little bit extra. We don't want to uh, risk ruining it, ruining it at this stage. Uh, so yeah, so I'll move the camera over to the saw, and you can watch me do that. Okay, so here we are. I'm just going to use this uh, table saw here. So as I say, it's going to be pretty much done by eye and to be honest with you that guy is set more or less in the right position oh, sounds like somebody's arriving so I'm going to run that down through there get that out just in case we need it
perfect. Okay, we'll try that, see how we get on. So I don't know if you can see that now, but that is fairly taken a lot of material away. It's made it a lot more streamlined. Uh, the wall thicknesses are going to be more equal all the way around. It's going to help with the sound of the flute. Uh, there's still obviously a lot of uh, sanding, etc., to do. If I had a thicknesser, I would probably have taken a lot of that off with a thicknesser, uh, which would give a, a nicer, a nicer finish. But uh, probably the next thing that we need to do is to shake that mouthpiece before we start uh, burning the holes in here to, to make the sound uh, nest, if you like. We need to have a method to be able to blow some air in there. So if we just roughly shake that mouthpiece off now, put some holes through, uh, that will make the whole process of tuning and creating a lot easier. So that'll be in the next phase. We only need to go in the other shed for that one. Okay. So here we are, this is the, if I bring that line up from the side, which we haven't touched yet, we can see that that is roughly the end of the chambers there. So we've got this all solid here. So I would say we want, so if, this, if we say that's roughly the center of that chamber, so we want, uh, say roughly that's the middle of there, so we want a hole there and a hole there. So we want them fairly close together. And then when we drill in, we'll drill a hole down in that angle there. So we're blowing air equally down both sides. So if we want a hole there and a hole there, so we need to make sure that the mouthpiece accommodate is enough to accommodate those holes. perhaps be a bit more generous with it as well maybe so we've got only about that much thickness wall there so we need to be aware of that when we're cutting maybe come out from back there that gives us plenty of scope to shape with the sander afterwards and removing material without fear of interfering with any of the, the same chamber. So let's go into the other room uh, and where the saw is and get that cut. Okay, so that's that one cut done. So I don't know if you can see here. We want sort of that sort of area for the mouthpiece. So for here, we just need to scallop that out. I don't know if you can hear Jack being a silly boy barking at the dustbin. Right, let's try that.
there you can see that's that's actually not perfect it's not come down low enough but I'm not going to mess around on the saw I'm going to I'm going to do that with a sander later on uh, if we, there's one thing that I've discovered with making flutes is I don't spend too much time getting all the nice finish and getting it all right until you've actually made the flute until it, it is tuned and okay and plays nicely then put the time into making it all look lovely because if you do put all that time into it and then you find out that you know and it's inevitably going to happen uh even when you've been making them a while sometimes you know they go wrong uh so you're just wasting a lot of time and effort but at the beginning you probably will find you'll make 20 or 30 flutes before you're happy with the one that you've made <laughs> that's just the way it goes okay welcome back we're back into the workshop again I've got a four millimeter drill bit here which I'm going to put into the drill uh, we're gonna we're gonna drill two holes here as I described earlier let's just mark this up uh, so about there and about there so I'm going to do this with a drill to begin with I should probably go through and well I should definitely go through trying to get it on right on the, the join between the two pieces of wood there we go so we've got to try and keep it fairly level Well, I'm very happy with that. Move that up there. Can you see that? Can you see that happening there? Good stuff. So those holes are nowhere near big enough that it's not going to provide enough air into the flutes to be able to, you know, play it properly. Uh, so we will enlarge those, but as I say, we'll burn them, and then there isn't so much sawdust and shavings. All these bits of wood going to go inside the sound chamber here, because uh, the only way we can get them out is through these holes. And these holes aren't incredibly big. If they stay in there, they obstruct the flow of air, as I described earlier when we were gluing, uh, and that will ruin the sound of the flute. Pop that there. So the next phase is to get the the blow lamp on the go. Uh, and to enlarge those holes and start working on this area here. So first thing we're going to do is, if we have a little look at this beautiful thing here, uh, if you do decide to do this and you want to use the blow lamp to uh, to use the heat, uh, you're going to have to have a method by which you can uh, hold it into one place to allow you to get your blow lamp onto it uh, without having to hold it as well. Uh, I mean these things here if I bring this down here you can see what they are they're just drill bits that I've just rounded off at the end a little bit and I put them into a little branch or block of wood of some description so another one uh, and they just stay in there and yeah that's a perfect thing so you use all different different sizes to make different size holes sorry I've got the places falling apart over there uh, so yeah this is the method we use so this is about, I don't know, five or six mil to begin with. So it's going to get noisy now for a minute. So the reason I do this uh, first, I don't know whether you'll be able to hear me over the top of this, but it is purely so that we've got enough air coming through this sound chamber. As soon as we've done that, we're going to be using this, this tool here to make the uh, the flu the hole down into the slow air chamber and the hole down into the sound chamber and then we're going to make that angled angle down like that to make the ramp so we can make a true sound hole you can see that's glowing nicely there now so i'm going to It's all very slowly slowly uh, it takes several several reheats to be able to get through 
in fact the majority of this whole process is just waiting for the metal to heat up Okay, so we're, about, we're through both holes now. I'm just going to reheat it again and just make sure that there, there's no obstructions in there. So, probably working on this camera here now. Uh, so this, whichever one's highest up, we need to go to that side of it. Okay. So yeah, that looks about right. And with this one, we need to come on the inside of it. This one's more important. then we've got to do is that's going to be judging by the where these holes are that's more or less center of each of the chambers so I mean we could do it with a ruler or I could do it by by eye it's about there so the width of this channel what I would say is I think it's roughly half the, rad the radius of the bore, half the diameter. Uh, sorry, I need to turn it round the other way. So, I would say, about there, about there. The trouble is, these holes aren't always bang they started off on the other side but if I went through on a slight angle then they won't be bang center so you have to sort of use your discretion a little bit uh, and it doesn't have to be half of that measurement there uh, but that is the optimal it doesn't matter if it's a bit narrower or a bit wider uh, it'll still work, function quite well the length isn't supposed to be overly long uh, but by the time we've got the ramp there's gonna be a ramp there going down there so that the air, that length there is the length of the actual flu, uh, and that really should be I think double the width. So it's the diameter, so an inch in this case. Because uh, with you, I don't think I actually discussed the uh, the bore diameter with you yesterday, but it's basically it's 20, uh, 24 point five twenty five millimeters. Uh, so that's roughly an an inch uh, diameter, uh, and that's sort of about the widest you'd want to go for an F sharp uh, as you start getting higher in pitch the bore needs to go smaller uh, so really that the bore for an F sharp should be somewhere around 22 23 mil so this is slightly large and we have to compensate for that by dropping the holes down slightly lower on the body but that's you I'm not even going to touch on the subject of the tuning and the positions of the holes because that is a subject which is just needs a video all of it all for itself uh, but or needless to say there's so many resources available Flutopia is a great one uh, which you can research and look at the best methods of tuning for you uh, if you decide to do this so we've marked that out I'm gonna sketch in the sort of between between six and eight mil sort of maximum sort of re size range for the true sound hole which is that area there uh, we're going to make obviously that's going to be a progressive ramp down into the 
slow air chamber. Pause the video there. I'm going to have a cup of tea. <laughs> and when I come back, we're going to start burning the top. Okay, so welcome back. I have my cup of coffee. And let's fire this up. So this time we're using this tool here, which is basically, I think it was a massive tent peg, which I heated up and bashed with a hammer and formed into this sort of L shape. Put it here so you can see clearly a nice flat bottom there on a bit of a sweeping angle to get that angle in there. You'll see as we go along. Uh, so that's a, an invaluable tool. So it was a tricky thing getting it just right on there. So we're going to heat that up. I often start actually with these two back holes. process goes a little bit quicker is once we've put that initial burn in drill a few little holes in there so there's less material to have to burn away let's just make a start here So as I say now, we can just drill some holes through there. Just makes the job go a little bit faster. See, we're, we're through there now. That's lovely. We're going to do the same on the other side now. So the next thing is to start working on this ramp. So I can already see the debris that's inside there from the drilling is already starting to block that hole as I blow through. So that hole needs to be made big enough to get all that out. I just felt it uh, felt it ping out the obstruction so hopefully there isn't too much more in there we'll just work on it a little bit more and then we'll start working on this one. 
for the files is to smooth off the uh, the burnt wood of the charcoal here is if it's too rough again that affects the flow of the air what that layer also does if it's too thick it prevents the the rod from burning deeper into the wood easily that looks tidy Because this is a drone flute, you've got two chambers that need to sound uh, ideally pretty in line with each other. Uh, th at this point, is if you if we can, that's why I'm doing one and then the other. I'm trying to get them as similar and as close to each other as possible, and it will make that uh, any adjustments I need to make just that much more slight if they're as tight it's like a band when they play together if they're tight it sounds so much better What I've done is I've just marked in the flu and the line. A lot of flute makers do don't use this method of burning. They will just use chisels and files and sandpaper to make all of these holes. Uh, and some people will make these holes while it's still in two separate halves uh, and work from the other side as well. Uh, and I used when I first started making flutes, that's the method I used. But I've sort of grown and adapted and this is what I've become comfortable with now. This is the method I prefer. So we're through. Now this bit is the most crucial and the hardest bit to get right. We don't want to make that hole too big. Uh, if we do, the flute will become too airy. So we want to make that ramp going down uh, carefully and slowly to make sure we don't get it too big uh, and we don't take too much material away. very easy to make mistakes at this point the other thing I would say to be careful of is that you don't come down too hard and burn the edge of that uh, the edge of the ramp away here the flu when you're pulling down it's very easy to knock that off that can affect the sound turbulence of the air as well so this is where the files are quite important is to remove that burnt material from there underneath that ramp we're aiming to go down like that you see on that sort of angle so we can keep 
just filing away that material when we put the, the rod in it can burn the wood easily a little bit of material whoops uh, and I'm gonna clean that up with, the, with this chisel, chisel now so we're going to take away the burnt material it should give us just enough depth so again to avoid disturbance of air turbulence to make it all run very smoothly the, sur the level uh, the surface of this glue needs to be dead flat and smooth through there and look down at the depths so I can see there's a bit more coming off just here when it goes into the ramp downwards see so if you got some sandpaper if you fold it and then make that loop trying to just go into that sort of width of that channel and then just run that down through there and we'll try this block or I won't clamp it on I'll just give it a little blow be interesting to get the tuner and just see what sort of note that's given us at this stage I'm not expecting it to be F sharp <laughs> I'm expecting it to be lower than F sharp probably just over E to F maybe uh, and we're going to bring it up to F sharp by cutting some off the bottom uh, okay so we need the the tuner on here this is set to 432 Hertz and it's just a general chromatic tuner. That there. Hopefully you'll be able to see that in my video. So let's give this a little blow again and see what we've got. So it's more or less F, that. Right? 
so it's not going to be an awful lot maybe about that much to come off to make it into an F sharp side that is more or less right we're gonna to have to just tidy it up clean it up a little bit uh, but the main thing now is to work on to this side to get it exactly the same as that one we can so you've watched me do that uh, at normal speed well more or less normal speed I expect might have speeded some of it up I don't know you know how to get to edit the video but I am going to do this on time lapse or fast forwards or something like that because you don't really need to watch all of that again unless something crops up which I think of that I need to to mention to you uh, I can imagine there will be uh, so yeah I'll see you at the end of making that and we'll get in that one to match that. So that was close. We've done the other. We've done the drone uh, sound hole for that uh, chamber. Uh, we're a bit of a close one. It was starting to get a little bit too big, uh, and it was overblowing as well, which jumps an octave as well. Uh, so that's why I chamfered in the uh, chamfered in this here, so that the air, more air was allowed to come out over the top, which just helps with that overblowing. So they're both roughly the same now. Not exactly the same because there's that drifting from one up to the other. I mean, it's slightly, just slightly not together. I'll blow the separate chambers so you can see. So they're both roughly F, but not exactly the same. Uh, so now I'm going to do the tuning. I'm going to move the camera over to the saw because it's quite a lot to do. Uh, so it's too much for a sand uh, so we're going to cut and I might end up having to put an, uh, an angle on the end to make it either one way or another depends on which way it goes I don't know uh, so that the both of the both of the chambers uh, one might need to be slightly shorter than the other one to allow them to be the same note so let's pop over to the saw uh, okay so here we are at the uh, <coughs> at the saw this is the tuner, this is the flute. So let's, it's about F. So I'm gonna take, start off by taking about that much off. Let's see how much it comes up. For reference point, let me give you a. You see that chamber, that's a drone chamber, that's just over F. And the melody chamber is just under F. So the chances are, I need to take less off that side, more off that side. So there's going to be an angle going like that, okay? But to begin with, we'll just go across straight and see what happens. Tap the sword just out. You 
see that's just shy of F sharp now. And again, that's about the same sort of, it's come up, it's not quite, it's F, top side of F, not quite into F sharp yet. So I need to take more off on this side. So if I sort of start there, put the, the flute on an angle like that, so when it comes out, it's going to take less off on this side and more off on that side. Let's have a look at the melody side again. So that's just creeping up into the F sharp territory. So they're not far off together now. Let's take some more off. block then on which angle I was supposed to be going on. Right, let's try it again. So they're not far off. The, the, uh, the drone chamber is spot on, on F sharp, and the melody chamber is still needing some more off it. So, I need to have it on a steeper angle now just to take try and take some more off on this. happy with that although I'm not happy with the way the melody chamber is playing and as I thought there's a little bit of debris in there I could tell it was very weak so I hope that hasn't affected the tuning of that side too much that's actually perfect because the melody side is slightly sharper than the drone side but as you do put the holes in to do the tuning what you'll find is that bass that that note will tend to drop a little bit anyway so by the time i put the rest of the holes in it should have dropped down to in line with the exact tuning of the drone channel if that all makes sense <laughs> see how they're not exactly together but the variation is tighter than it was when we listened to it before it's a it's a it's a quicker uh, modulation if you like of notes and as the modulation gets faster and faster and faster as it comes together to be one uh, in tune note so that's it that's as much of the tuning as I'm going to do on it uh, when it comes to the sanding, there'll be a little bit more coming off, but not enough to affect the tuning to any great degree. So the next job is to start marking out the holes, uh, burning the holes and tuning up the scale of the minor pentatonic scale. And that is quite complex. Uh, it's, it's simple really, but it's complex, probably complicated to explain to you, but we're gonna, have a go, we're going to go back over to the other work surface over there, get the cameras on there, and we're going to mark out where the holes need to be. Uh, and I'll try and explain it to you as easily. Okay, so let me explain what we need to do. We need to measure the distance between the back of the sound hole, and this here is a sound hole, so the back where it actually meets the edge of the flue. So the distance between that point and the end of the chamber. Now, because it's on an angle, you might say, well, where do I measure? But just measure 
smack bang in the middle of that chamber. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, so then we're going to go from, we're going to draw a line, we're going to go halfway in between that chamber. So we're going to join them two lines up and draw a pencil line down there. So this acts as two things. Still in frame, yeah, just about. Uh, so this axis two things. This is going to be the line that the holes are going to go on. So they're all, all the, the finger holes go in one straight line. Yeah, and it ensures they're in the center of the chamber. And it also gives us something to draw against when we're going to make the marks now for the finger positions. Okay, so that distance that we need to measure, remember it's from the back of the sound hole. So I'm going to measure this and following that line. So we've got 375. Uh, so that's 25, that's 12 and a half, 150. Uh, so that's uh, 162 and a half. Is that correct? Uh, 162 and a half. Let me do some long division just to make sure. I might skip this out of the video. My mental arithmetic is rubbish. 375. Is that what I said? I said 326. So it's 375. Divided by 2. 2's into 3 goes 1. Carry 1. 2's into 17 goes 8. Carry 1. 2's into 15 goes 7. Carry 1. 2's into 10, go 5. So I get 187.5. Okay, so that's going to be the halfway point. one. So that's the midpoint between those there, there and there. That's great. That's, that's the first stage. Then we'll, from that mark, we want to measure down six millimeters. Okay, and that's going to be hole position number three. So, the average rule of thumb is 25 mil an inch uh, for, for the spacings. That's the ideal spacing for finger holes. Another rule of thumb is that this finger hole spacing should be roughly the same diameter as the flute. And because this is an inch diameter flute, that's even better. So, let's measure 25 down from hole 3. And then 25 down again. So that gives us one, two, three holes, the bottom three holes. Uh, so this is a five, going to be five hole flute. What we do is we kind of measure then up from that third position up to get to the fourth, fifth and sixth holes. But we're not going to put the fourth hole in because it's a five hole flute. Now the difference between that set of three and the top set of three, uh, basically what I'm trying to say is you want to just move them anything when your bore diameter gets to an inch or more you need to move the top three holes northwards by varying amounts and this is this is where just experience comes in now what I tend to do is I tend to move it up instead of moving it up an inch uh, measuring an inch from the hole three I'll measure an inch and a quarter on an F sharp so there's an inch and a quarter and I'll go up and I'll say that's hole four, but we're not going to put hole four in. But what we will do is we'll measure 25 up from hole four to give us hole five. And that hole we are going to put in. <laughs> and 25 again up and that becomes hole six. So that one there is not going to have, we're not going to burn that one. So we're going to start 
at this bottom hole here. Now some people burn the holes, they use a template from an old flute or whatever and they know it's the same bore diameter and the same uh, chamber length etc so they they use the old the other flute as a template to mark the holes in and that's great if you want to make an exact duplicate of a flute that you already have but you must ensure that everything is exactly the same i.e. the the diameter of the, uh, the bore and the length of the chamber. If it varies then the whole plate positions will vary also. So that's not always a good way of doing it. Uh, this this method isn't always 100% successful because what you'll find is it's equal whole, equal spacing means that the variations for the tuning means that the holes either have to be smaller or bigger. So you can get into a position where your holes are too small and they don't let, let enough air out so then you don't get a clear note or they're too big. Uh, you have to keep going bigger and bigger to make them higher and higher to get the tuning right but then you end up with a huge hole uh, and some people with smaller fingers are able to cover them very efficiently so they find that difficult to play. So it is a balancing. It's this, uh, the bigger bore the flute and the deeper the tone of the flute uh, the bigger the spacings need to be between the holes and the higher north that they need to go. The other consideration is the wall thickness. If you've got a particularly thin walled flute or thick walled flute, that will also affect the positioning and size of the holes. Very complicated uh, subject and it's only really through experimentation and using uh, making a few flutes that you come to realise uh, the relationship between the fundamental key and the bore and the length uh, so that's six millimeters we've measured down should be should be ideal for this key of flute with this bore length if anything the holes might be too slightly bigger than they need to be uh, but if it was say we had a big bore like this and we wanted to do an, an uh, a G or an A then the hole unless we increase the amount that we drop these bottom three holes the, the finger holes would be too big we'd have to make them too big to make them high enough i'll stop talking now and stop burning holes <laughs> right here we go so it's a little bit nerve-wracking burning this first hole because uh, you don't want it to be too low and you don't want it to be too high. You don't want a huge hole and also you don't want a small hole. So uh, this book that I've got here, yeah, I should bring it out onto there. So this is the notes for all of the different keys for the minor pentatonic scale. So we're going for F sharp. So we're going F, F sharp here is the first note. That's the, the note with all of the holes closed, i.e. there's no holes in it. The first hole that we make here, we're aiming for it to be the note of A. Uh, and I'm going to go and get the tuner because I've left it over there.
Okay, I'm going to turn that off so that you can hear what we're saying and everything else. There is an, uh, another thing, the, uh, when the wood is hot, because it's just been burnt, it creates hot air or warm air. Now, warm air travels at a different velocity than colder air. So the tuning of this won't be completely accurate until that's all cooled down. The other thing is the flute won't play if it's full of smoke. Uh, and every time you burn a hole, the chamber fills with smoke. So before you go to tune it, make sure you <laughs> clear the air out of it. So if I hold that, it should be F sharp. So what were we aiming for? We're aiming for A, and what have we got? So we're going to G sharp, which is good because we want this hole to be a lot bigger than it is now. Uh, and it'll get bigger uh, and then we'll hopefully we've only got to go from G sharp to A which isn't a huge jump uh, so that'll make it a nice size so we look for the, the next size up is this one so if if there was a huge jump and we and you say we need that that wasn't a G sharp Say it was a G and we'd need to come up quite a lot so I might use a bigger rod you know uh, but this is just going to bring it up a little bit and we'll bring it up gradually so then we'll make sure we don't overshoot the notes because once it's gone too high we can't make it come down again you know we can't make the hole smaller so it is about gradually sneaking up on it This probably won't make an awful lot of difference, this particular one. So it's at the very top end of G's chart, approaching the lower end of A. So the next one up, let's have a look what we got. This one. So I'll do this one and then I'll probably uh, just fast forward it for you uh, until such time as I need to point out something out. Or else it's going to be a very long and boring video for you. What you'll find is you will you'll tune these to as close as you can. Every time you burn a new hole in there you'll find the one below it has probably just dropped a little bit because it all affects the passage of the air. Even though you've got the hole covered there is still the thickness of the wall where air will be trying to get into which will affect the pitch of the note it's very complicated very technical but it's simple when you've done it a few times and you get a, more of a feel for it it's more of an art form really so we can get a more accurate reading. So that's still uh, flat. It's not up to the A yet. And, it's, and I just wanted, but I wanted to mention that if you blow uh, sh hard, your note will be sharper. And if you blow gently, it'll probably be a bit flatter. So let me demonstrate. So I'm going to blow very gently. You can see it's just about a G sharp uh, at the top end of G sharp I'm gonna blow more with more gusto this time so it's only a few degrees under A when I'm blowing with a bit of gusto so you have to allow for that in your tuning as well and also allow for the hole to cool now this probably needs to go to the next size which size have we got Actually, no, it probably doesn't want to go to the next size because the next size is going to be too big. It's one of these. This would probably send it sharp. Uh, it'll go over A. So what 
but after I've done the rest of them, it might not. So what I'm tempted to do now is instead of fine tune, fine trying to fine tune that one, is to go to the next hole, uh, and we'll start again with a little one. sharp so half a step up to get to the B which is roughly about what was happening with the first hole if you remember it was a half step to get up to the, ne the right note so instead of messing about with that one I'm gonna go straight for that one a little bit more a quarter step so I am going to go for the bigger hole this time that's the next size up now the third hole nearly always is if these holes are that size whatever size these two bottom holes are you can guarantee the third hole will be a little bit bigger so these are working out to be a fairly large just well just about right really so to stop that third hole being too big we could actually move it up by a couple or three millimeters uh, which will keep it a bit smaller so there's a little tip see that hole is considerably larger I'm hoping it's gonna be bang on B you can see it's still a little bit flat and that A is still flat let's have another listen to that A So at this point, I think before we go further, I'm going to make that A the same size as that one. So before I go into fast forward mode, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to demonstrate to you another little trick that we could use. Uh, as if we only need to go up a very small amount, we can what, what we call undercut the hole with the smallest one. So you can kind of just go in and burn a little bit of the material away inside the hole and that'll raise the pitch of the note. Now mind, by making this hole larger now, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that this one will have dropped. <laughs> Slightly high. but that one's spot on. Now I'm hoping that this one's gonna drop that very small amount when we put the next hole in. Here we go. So I'm actually gonna take this a, a little bit higher so we don't have such a big hole. Only a couple of mils at the most. Hopefully it should allow that hole to do the same as that one. It's a very time consuming job this, you know. I'm going to go around the stool. Oh, that's better. If I can get comfortable on my little stool. <laughs> Thank you. 
So the next note we're headed for is a C sharp. According to my little piece of paper there. Which hasn't let me down yet. So it's just shy of C. just over C and we've got to get it all the way up to C sharp. Well it's fast approaching C sharp, hopefully this next one is a biggie, it'll take us nearly all the way. Okay, so I might go with uh, the biggest. This is the biggest one that I use. Any bigger than this and the whole size is just get too big. Uh, so yeah, anything more than this and you have to use the undercut method. This is only very marginally bigger than this one, fractionally. But it's all okay. It will be fine. Okay, let's turn that off for a sec so we can hear properly what's happening. <coughs> oh, never breathe in. Never breathe in instead of blowing. So very, very slightly under. And that's with the drone uh, as well. So that's lovely. So I'm going to use the little one now just to undercut that very, very slightly there, just to bring it up a tad. Tiny, tiny little bit more. Okay, in light of those being so, uh, needing to be so large, the holes, I think I measured an inch and a quarter, didn't I? From there to there, I did. So I'm actually going to raise that by probably, let's say, five mils onto hole five and six. So the next one on here is E. So 
we're nearly at D sharp. So just over the step. So that's not bad, we're nearly E. This next one will take us spot on, I bet. So yeah, so just a little bit more and we'll be at F sharp. And once we get to that stage, we need to just very carefully go up through all the holes again and do any fine tuning that we need to do. to the other side. There we go. Because it was not quite sealing it properly across the whole of the two of them. So let's start with the bolt node. Can you see how that's changed? Uh, since it's cooled down, that one isn't quite so high anymore. Let's play it with the drone. I'm liking that. There isn't an awful lot uh, to do really now. So what we do really after we finish doing these adjustments on the tuning is to take it back into the other workshop and start sanding and shaping and making it all very pretty. Beautiful. Happy with that. We'll go to the other workshop and we'll start playing at tidying it up and making it look very beautiful as well as sounding beautiful. See you a bit.
Right, here we are, back in the workshop. We've done the sanding out there and the shaping, etc. Now, when we, uh, we were before, when we, before we glued this flute together, remember we put these two little holes in here uh, to accommodate the lacing for the blocks. And uh, we only glued through, uh, drilled through one side to enable us then now, one of the finishing jobs is to continue that drill all the way through to the back. And that's what we're gonna do next. So here we go, I've put the, uh, the eight mil drill bit back into the drill here. And we're just gonna carry on these holes through to the bench. All that work trying to keep the debris out of there. <laughs> and now I'm uh, probably filling them up. Okay, I'm going to tidy them holes up with the, uh, the Dremel. Okay, so hopefully you can see now, that's just finished them off nicely. Okie dokie. So, to be able to, uh, to keep these blocks on, as I say, we're going to have uh, some leather thong. Now you can buy that on a roll, uh, but I tend to buy these scraps, these offcuts for uh, different things, trims and things that I want to make on my uh, creations. So it makes sense for me just to cut some strips out of this to use for that purpose. So I'm just going to whiz, whiz down here. Uh, if you decide to make your own flute, you can. You can do this, or you can buy some song, or you could use uh, an old strap off a necklace, or you could you could use a multitude of things, even down to just some plain old string if it was just purely as a practical thing. But you know, I make these flutes, and I want to sell them, uh, so I want them to be as attractive as possible. So there we go, there's one. I want them to be strong enough to be able to put a really tight knot in there without snapping. So we need four, we're gonna have two, one either side there, one either side there, so we want four in total. Right then, here we go. I've set up the, uh, the laptop and the laser engraver. It's a pretty straightforward process. I think this was about, I don't know, £80 on eBay or something like that. Uh, it's a great little tool uh, for burning design into wood. So I've just had it up on here, F sharp, enter the text, it's ready to go. Uh, I'm going to hit the button and you can watch it on fast forward. It's quite a nice little experience for you. Okay, right then, so we've just finished the engraving. Uh, I've just given it a final little sand over. I've got the engraving on there, as I say. It's had it sanded, it's ready for a coat of lacquer. And uh, it's gonna take several coats of lacquer with a little light sand in between. Just use this acrylic lacquer. Should be, before I have it on there, it's a good idea to, with the top and bottom, freestyle. Yeah. So this, this will absorb straight in this first coat. Uh, so yeah, we'll come back in about an hour, give that a light sun and another coat. 
Okay, so this is now dry, this first coat. And what happens is when the lacquer goes in uh, to the wood, the fibers start to break and lift. So it goes, you know, you, you can feel little rough areas where the fibers of the wood start to just, just separate from each other a little bit. So what this does, it brings it back smooth. And also allows a key for the next coat. So even though this is a really, really thin coat of, of lacquer, where it sits onto the flue there, uh, that can actually affect the playing of the flute. So, uh, so we need to be careful that we don't put too much in that particular uh, area, or else we're gonna have a restriction of air, which will affect the sound. But we'll monitor that uh, once we've finished. I'm gonna grab the blocks, actually. The block's gonna have to have a little layer of lacquer. I'm done with them. Oh. In my pocket. <laughs> I'm gonna put these down the bottom here. I'm just gonna put a little layer just on the uh, on the bottom of the blocks. That's all it needs. Uh, and I'll, once I was right, spin them over and do the other side. Okay. We'll come back in another hour. Okay, that goes dry. Time for the next one. Do another sand as well. Okay, welcome back. Uh, had several layers, I think four layers now of lacquer, uh, and I could leave it just like that actually, uh, but it's a little bit shiny and uh, I'm not really that keen on lacquer, I prefer a more muted, duller type look. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just get a very light sand over. I'm going to do a little bit of work on the uh, on the flue, like I said before, don't really want to build up a lacquer on there too much. You want some on there, and you want to protect the wood from the moisture that's going to build up there from our, our breath. Okay, so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to put some beeswax on there just to give it that finish. So it's going to be a, a semi-sheen finish rather than a high gloss finish. So if you're going to do this for yourself, what I would say is just be a bit careful putting when you're putting the beeswax on, that you don't get uh, you don't get bits of beeswax going down into the mouthpiece or uh, into the sound chamber here and causing blockages. So you want a nice, a nice paste rather than a solid block maybe. I'll just put it on quite sparingly. So this is looking beautiful. It 
which smells lovely too. The beeswax on oak. Wow, what a combination. Okay. We're not far off now being finished. So I'm just going to let that sit on the wood for a little while uh, and then I'll buff it up with a, a, a fresh cloth in a minute uh, and then we'll be ready to put the blocks on and I'll bring the camera in close so you can see the process of that as well because that's a tricky job. Okay so what you want to do for this with this is if you see on this one end on all of these I've sort of cut it quite narrow to be able to get it down through the holes. The other thing that you're going to need for this job is basically this is just a piece of copper wire I stripped out of an electrical cable and it's to allow you to push that up through put the the, uh, the thong through there and I'll demonstrate now actually thread that through there pull that and there you go, and you're through. So we need this one to go back down through there again. So we're going to push a copper wire through. Put it into there, pull down. And that'll come over there. And then we've got when the block goes in there. So we'll pull them down tight. So we need to do the same thing again here. On the first one through, actually, we don't really need to use that copper tool. So we'll probably get the first one down on its own. You gotta remember this is the the easy side. <laughs> when we do the other side, we're gonna we've already got the holes full of this here. So let's push this through there again. This is the one we want. Push that through there. So, okay, so let's do the other side. I don't know if you noticed, but this it probably won't matter with the uh. With what you're using because it might not necessarily be the same but this has got a shiny side and it's got a, a suede dull side so i've tried to do it so that they're all the same uh, so what let's do is find the correct ends to go with the right ends that's, that's right there These two. Pull that up a little bit. Slide the block in. Hold it with your finger. And then we need to pull these two. Tie this, I normally tie it so that it is going against this bottom corner here and pull that tight. So this one here is a bit easier because that block's already being held. Now 
you can see there now. So I'm holding it nicely, all nice and tight. So it doesn't, it's not so tight that it won't actually move if you need to adjust it. But that's got it. got it on there tight as well and that actually looks quite attractive I think it goes dangling down like that and you can't see a thing because I've lifted it too high there you go okay so here we are indoors at the workshop <laughs> and we've completed this flute from scratch to being able to play a beautiful melody hopefully now I'm just gonna give it a little play for you to have a little listen to uh, so yeah hope you've enjoyed watching the video and uh, if you're on a, a mission to make your own flute I hope it offers you some good pointers and, and maybe a little bit of advice uh, on how to avoid some of the pitfalls so yeah so let's have a little play and see what it sounds like sounding flute very pleased with that thanks for watching I'm crow spit driftwood hollow drums bye for now